much, everybody, for coming. So this event is really special because um, it's just the, literally the brainchild of all of these folks here. The conversations with everybody here at the, on the panel, we've just decided that we wanted to go ahead um, and talk with you. And talk with you about three things that are dear to us and that I think that connect our work. Um, morality, race, and the body. So just for the recording sake, I'm Jamie Thomas. I'm here in linguistics at Swatcher College. And I'll just go through and just sort of list uh, all these wonderful, great scholars here at the table um, here to my left. First is uh, Jess Wright. She's at Princeton in classics, and her work sort of concerns brains and bodies and all kinds of things. Um, next, we have Paul Mitchell, who I met through the Penn Museum. Um, he is working in forensic anthropology and concerned with scientific racism and the lobby. Um, next, Yvonne Chirot here in religion at Swarthmore College. And we have the privilege in my seminar this semester to have her come in and tell us about the way that Vodou is a collective practice. And um, tell us a little bit more about where zombies, the concept sort of came from. So it's such a pleasure to have her here with us. Um, next we have Krista Thomason, and I'm going to say it right. <laughs> uh, that's what I call it there. Um, but in philosophy, and she and I over the last year or so, last year or two, have had these intermittent conversations about all kinds of discourses pertaining to morality, ethics, um, emotion, and it's so wonderful to have her here with us too. Finally, Christina Jackson. Um, she and I are good friends going back to maybe like just a couple years ago. <laughs> Feels long. <laughs> because we get along so well because there's so many intersections in our work. She's a sociologist at Stockton University um, working on issues related to gentrification. Um, so spaces, cities, urban um, <coughs> ecologies, and um, talking about bodies and protests. So across all of us, we really care about bodies, um, and that's what we want to talk about today. Um, we have another colleague, Emily August, also at Stockton University in Literature. We're going to share some images that she um, has for us. She's under the weather and not able to join us, but her stuff is really fascinating. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to the Department of Linguistics for sponsoring this great event. And in the back, once we're sort of done up here in the front, I want to invite you to interact just a little bit more around the food um, because we have little snippets from a digital exhibit that is the work of my esteemed students here. Um, and so they'll be able to sort of tell you a little bit more. Digital exhibit is about zombies. And from zombies we get to thinking about bodies, discourse, and many of these other things. So our first question today um, is what is human? And really quickly I want to give everybody here at the table a chance to sort of introduce their own um, entry point into the themes for tonight and then we'll get into this question. So if you have any thoughts I hope that you will interact with us. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Jamie, so much for inviting us here. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here with you all. I should, I should talk into this. Is that okay? Um, so my name is Jessica Wright, and I work on um, ideas and representations of the brain in the 4th and 5th century CE in Christian texts from North Africa, Syria, Italy, Spain, and I guess the intersection, the point at which Jamie and I really started talking about um, my involvement in this event um, is in the, um, so I guess one of my central questions in my dissertation is the way in which the brain is helpful for other Christians in thinking about the health of the soul. Um, and so if the brain is a seat of virtue, if the brain is a source of knowledge, what does it mean if your brain goes wrong? 
And so this was, I guess, the first point of conversation. I was, I think, very surprised at first um, that work on the fifth and fourth and fifth centuries would be of interest in a conversation about racism because I was like, people weren't really talking about racism at that period. And then I began thinking about ways in which the other works in the, the medical texts and theological texts that I work with and the way that um, <coughs> ideas about mental illness and the brain and uh, in-group, out-group identity and Christianity provide a basis for later conversations about this. Well, I will echo Jessica's uh, thanks to Jamie for what would certainly be an interesting conversation. Uh, my name is Paul Mitchell. Uh, well, let's just bring that closer oh. to you. Okay. Or I'll bring the closer to you. Um, there's, there's many ways to do things. Uh, so uh, my name is Paul Mitchell. I'm a graduate student in anthropology uh, at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I am, I think, built here as a forensic anthropologist. I think that's partially true. I have done some forensic work, but my primary um, or at least a good part of my training is concerned on uh, physical anthropology generally, which is the physical or the biological study of the human species. Um, uh, however, a great deal of my interest has shifted since to the history of science and cultural anthropology, in many ways associated with some of these themes. Uh, I've been very lucky to excavate uh, skeletons uh, all over the world, uh, spending a lot of time, particularly in East Africa, but also in places like Israel and uh, uh, Southeast Europe. Um, so, I'll just say a few things here and then we'll get into some of the, the meat of the issue. Uh, obviously, uh, when we think about the human species as an evolved species, uh, we are thinking about a set of lineages uh, that have their own distinct characteristics. There have been many different ways to classify and characterize these different characteristics that are seen in different lineages or populations of the human species. Um, in modern times, the practice of this classification is scientific racism. Uh, I will note here that the scientific racism that has existed over the last few hundred years has primarily been, well, the last 150 years has been primarily Darwinian. Uh, the, the classificatory schemes that have been produced have not always been hierarchical, but almost always have. Uh, so when I think about that, uh, about classification and hierarchy, uh, in so-called objective terms. Uh, it's a worthwhile thing to remember two facts, I think, and we can get into the details, uh, that uh, when we think about uh, evolutionary science, uh, a lot of the classification and the language of classification that we use uh, goes back to the very beginning. Uh, of course, it's worthwhile to remember that the full title of Darwin's book was On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or all these Victorian books have very long titles, or uh, uh, the, uh, the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Um, so uh, that's worthwhile to reflect upon, as well as the fact that a lot of the language that Darwin uses is necessarily imported from earlier time, a uh, time before his conceptual, uh, as it were, revolution, um, really permeated biological science. And so he's bringing in language of race, uh, bringing in language of um, class, and bringing in classificatory language that ultimately is probably, I would make the claim, not appropriate. Uh, to understand the phenomena that he wants to study, uh, but nonetheless is very frequently used even today in evolutionary biology and physical anthropology. Uh, so in any case, my questions and my thinking largely revolves around this topic of how historically data have been produced, made up, sometimes quite literally made up, and then sort of conceptually made up to support ideas of human difference uh, in, in hierarchy and classification. Uh, how those justifications and practices have changed through time, and where those stand today, uh, if they have any place to stand at all. So, we'll go from there. Okay. Um, I'm Yvonne Chiro. I think I'm the oldest one on this panel, so I'm the elder. <laughs> I'm uh, the elder here. Which is part of a venerable tradition in African and African religions, the elder mother, uh, the wise mother. I'll claim that. So I, I, I'm interested in religion, um, broadly and then more narrowly I'm interested in African religion, <laughs> African American religion, what has been classified as black religions um, in the field of religion. 
But I think that, you know, um, and I'm really happy to be here. I don't, I don't know how we wound up here, but I, I was delighted to meet Jamie just a few years ago. We were talking about beers and, and one of these things where they fed us. And, um, <laughs> it's, really, it's really interesting the way that, you know, the conversations sort of link together. And you're really an anchor for doing that. So really, thanks for this. Um, but I, I'm, I'm interested in religions, but specifically African American, American religions and American religions. Um, and I think that one of the things that I'm here to think about or to think through is the relationship of religion and the body. How religion, uh, in particular uh, Haitian Vodou, um, constructs, creates, imagines the body against, um, the, as a kind of other, against conceptualizations of the body elsewhere in Western religions, particularly Western Christianity. So I came to the class and we had this conversation about X-Files and pseudo-Voodoo and, and zombies, which is all very interesting to me. I, I, um, I, I run a blog, I run a blog, I write on a blog that is, uh, uh, concerned with all things voodoo. So voodoo as a kind of trope for a kind of African spirituality that plays around with ideas of subversively in some cases, not so subversive in other cases. So I'm interested in the, the idea of voodoo distinct from the religion of Aiki, a uh, uh, whole popularly voodoo, but actually Sevilloa, which is uh, the Creole term for the, the native religion. So there's a lot of places I think that the conversation can hook up with conceptions of the other, but also embodiment uh, in relation to, to religion, to relation to culture, in relation to race. It, voodoo sort of encapsulates so many of those ideas. It's a, it's a, it's a great utility term. It's like a garbage term in some ways for anything having to do with blackness and bodies and, and, and spirituality. So I have some images um, that when, when we get to the heart of the conversation that I want to show that sort of you know reiterate some of these, these linkages. Um, but I, I can't wait to get to the zombies because that's, <laughs> that's really what, what we want to know about. So, so thank you for bringing me. Sure. Well, so just really quickly, I just want to sort of point out that we're already talking about bodies and body parts. My friends and I over here say the meat of the matter, right? Paul, uh -huh. well, she just mentioned the heart of the discussion. So should I talk about the liver? I mean, <laughs> The reason why I find this so interesting is because I feel like language is something that is innate or it has to be there in order for us to feel human. Um, and that's what sort of sets us apart as human beings, is to be able to communicate in these levels. Um, and so I look at language as sort of a river that runs through all of it, and that's my concern is discourse and how we end up talking about bodies, body parts, religion, how do we just understand these things? Because we understand them through talking about them. Um, so I can just pass it on to my colleague here. Okay, bye. I'm um, Krista Thompson. I'm in the philosophy department. Um, uh, my research is in sort of two different areas in philosophy, in moral philosophy and in political philosophy. Uh, both of my interests in those areas, I think, are pertinent to the panel. And of course, thanks to Jamie for having me here. Um, and I'm glad you just said that we feel like language is kind of River that runs through all of us, um, and the communication is sort of part of what it is to be human. And so I, I, I totally agree with that. I also think that um, moral sensitivity, moral concern, is also part of what it means to be human. That of course doesn't mean that all human beings are good people, but it does mean that there's a kind of um, moral relationships, uh, moral sensitivity, moral concerns. Um, when those things go well and when those things don't go well, I think are also sort of maybe uniquely a part of um, what it means to be human. Um, in particular, I'm interested in the way in which moral emotions are a part of moral life. And um, that, there's an undercurrent of embodiment sort of in emotion literature because a lot of the uh, thinking about emotions is thinking about 
sort of the way we live as moral beings and the way we sort of think of ourselves and conceptualize both ourselves and each other as moral beings. Um, and so a lot of my research is kind of about how we view ourselves from the inside and how emotions are part of how we see ourselves as moral creatures. Um, the other part of my research is in political philosophy, particularly in human rights. So I think a lot, a lot, a lot about the question of dehumanization and what it means to dehumanize someone, what it means to not quote unquote see somebody else as human, how that's both um, an intentional process and sometimes an unintentional process. So um, that's, I, I think, although that's a, a word, dehumanization is a word that people I think use a lot. If you ask me, I don't think enough people have tried to figure out exactly what it means and how it works. So uh, that's, those are sort of, I think, part of the, the, my entry points into the conversation, I would say. Um, so uh, my name is Christina Jackson, and I'm a professor at Stockton University. Um, thanks to Jane for putting this together. This is awesome. I'll try not to be so much the outlier on the panel. <laughs> I'll, I'll play that role. But I, but I mean, everything that everyone is saying very much relates to kind of what I, a piece of what I'm doing with my work. Um, I, so I'm an urban sociologist and I um, study power inequality in cities, specifically with a focus on low income and communities of color. Um, most of my research is ethnographic from the ground up, so I spend a lot of time um, in communities, um, building rapport with them. Um, developing a relationship with um, different residents, interviews, observations, giving back through participant observation, other forms like that. So that's what I'm overall interested in. Um, today I'm going to talk to you guys about um, a manuscript that back in grad school um, I never did anything with. You know how we have all these different projects and yeah. just tucked it away. And when Jamie talked about this, I was like, oh. It has a place, you know? <laughs> and so this is an old manuscript back when I was taking my Foucault class. Hey. And so it's called Bodies and Protests, How Rule Breaking Residents Challenge Decision Making Process in San Francisco. And so this was my work, obviously, on San Francisco, um, primarily with a uh, low income community of color group that is fighting to have a say in a couple things large scale redevelopment, gentrification environmental toxicities and policing of the neighborhoods. The specific neighborhood that I focused on was Baby Hunters Point, if you are familiar with it, in the Fillmore neighborhood, um, close to downtown. So I you know, observed, it took um, place in a lot of community meetings with institutional stakeholders in the neighborhood. So I throw around that term, but I forget that like, I need to also explain what it is. But um, basically, entities that have a state in the neighborhood but don't necessarily live in the neighborhood. So the Navy, particularly because of the Hunters Point Shipyard, which was a major source um, of employment, comfort, stability in the Hunters Point um, area in San Francisco, um, the redevelopment agency, uh, you know, different type of entities that have, say, large corporations that want to buy in and make the Hunters Point. Um, so, so I look at those. Today what I wanted to do is I wanted to play with some ideas um, from Foucault in Discipline and Punish to try to understand how community bodies who feel under attack or isolated or pushed out of the decision-making process, um, you know, how that fits within what we're saying in terms of being in a, a kind of system of power or landscape of power in the city. Um, and so I believe that residents use in these meetings, and I'll talk about this when we get to the meat of the conversation, <laughs> but, um, you know, residents use these kind of micro forms of resistance that upon first glance we say, they're just breaking the rules. Why don't they just be quiet? Why don't they just follow the agenda? But upon thinking about it a little bit further, I, I realized something else was going on here. And I think it had a lot to do with power. And so, you know, a lot of the residents that I see would call out, talk out a term, facial expressions, purposely come late, purposely not whisper. I was like, why are all these things going on? Why are all these things happening? So I, I realized, and we'll talk, you know, later about it, but, um, that they use these micro forms of resistance to challenge these macro level decision making processes in San Francisco and your neighborhoods. So um, I think somewhat relates, and I think that um, you know this process of othering. Um, you know, I don't think we tend to traditionally think about it in actual communities, but um, I think that there's a lot there. So I look forward to hearing. What you're doing. So maybe we can just tackle this question here: uh, What is human from our different perspectives? 
who's ever to read any kind of talk on this. I'm mean, a very brief, just looking at sort of briefly interject so, mm -hmm. some perspective. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I can, I'll offer a brief, quick overview that is perhaps the broadest, <laughs> and that is from the perspective of uh, biology. Uh, and when you understand the human species from a biological perspective, uh, you understand that we are, in fact, the mosaic of traits that separates us from, uh, from any other species. Uh, we have certain features that we think are unique, uh, perhaps a certain kind of facility in the language, uh, certain structures in the brain that regulate uh, syntax, uh, some kind of uh, more feeling or sense, uh, perhaps other features cognitively, uh, abstract reasoning, symbolic representation generally. Um, uh, obviously, these are features that have a genetic basis. Um, there are physical features that also, too, have a genetic basis. Uh, these, each of these features has a history that is, has variable time gaps. So, for example, um, human ancestors have been walking for at least four million years. Um, but human ancestors have not been speaking for probably nearly that long for a much shorter period of time. So where we are today, so to say, is one particular point on a series of evolving processes. The bundle of traits that we are, uh, each have their own unique histories, but we are just some bundle of different traits, as it were, bound together in an organism with certain adaptations uh, that could be very different in the future as a species, um, uh, but uh, nonetheless uh, has a very deep past. And the thing that I'll say about humans that's perhaps most curious to me as someone who studies study the deep past is the way we live today is very, very bizarre, if you will, from a statistical perspective on our species. Um, for the vast majority of our lineage's existence, we existed in Africa. Uh, for the vast majority of our species' existed, in existence, we existed in a, way of, in, in a way of life that was dramatically different from anything that we see today. Uh, commonly on the planet. That is, that we were nomadic hunter-gatherers, our ancestors were at least, I don't think any of us are, uh, nomadic hunter-gatherers uh, who did not have any, probably any possessions more than they could carry, not only probably semi-permanent, if at all, any kind of, even semi-permanent uh, habitation. Um, there was no domestic, there were no domesticated animals, there was no reliance on any kind of agricultural products, obviously, this is for agricultural. Uh, probably a, a division of labor that was only based uh, on age and maybe to some degree sex, although that's very well contested from what we know. Uh, and uh, um, there's good reason to believe um, that uh, uh, our numbers were very low on the globe, uh, that people did have local cultures for many millions of years, so people were adapted ecologically, maybe even socially, to different environments for a very long time, culturally. We had you know, clothing and things like this uh, that adapted us to very cold climates, or uh, we had you know, technologies to extract resources from many different environments for a long time. But the point is this, is that only in the last 10,000 years out of the last 20,000 years that our species has been on, excuse me, 200,000 years that our species has been on the planet. So that is one fifth, one twentieth of our species tenure on the planet have we had any kind of agricultural subsistence, uh, any kind of sedentism, uh, any kind of hierarchy, uh, socially, uh, and only very recently, historically, has this big question of human difference come to be a, whether in terms of species, uh, uh, or I should, I should say, this question of human difference within the species come to be an important question. For a very long time, humans differentiated themselves from the animal kingdom. Uh, we know, for example, about cave paintings that show, strangely, a bunch of animals. The earliest cave paintings we have, for the first 20,000 years of cave paintings, are all only animals. The only humans that you ever see, despite there being beautiful bison, lions, or mammoths painted on cave walls, the only humans you ever see are stick figures. We have no idea why this is. There's no plants, only stick figure humans, and but beautifully drawn animals. So we could have presumably drawn humans relatively well. But the question is this: is that okay? The the present moment is very weird. It's some constellation of, of processes that happen to be at some point in their own sort of trajectories. Uh, but it's very weird today, and this question of human difference, I would say, is a very recent one in the span of our, of our uh, species. There are historical, I mean, sort of written historical uh, uh, questions, pretty modern ones, that 
that uh, bring us to the questions that we have here today, but they are very new ones in the current span of the human species. So I'll throw that out there as the big, broad level contextualization, and uh, maybe we can get into the nitty gritty details from there. Mm -hmm. I, I just wonder out loud, I don't know if this is the way we're supposed to do it. When, when you said human difference, I, 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 I'm thinking as I'm talking, um, I'm wondering whether humans also define themselves against another that is not human, as you said, the animal. Um, beyond that, so thinking in terms of religion, does is it possible to think of human as defined or self-defined against another, not animal, or not the thing that comes after humanity, which would be, question mark, divinity, superhuman, and so forth. So I'm wondering if, if um, one way that we can define humanity, or one way that humanity defines itself beyond as a, a, a species, is against an other. Mm -hmm. So we got the animals, that's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Is there something at the other end mm -hmm. um, that we can say that humans think of what it is to be human against? I, I, we I, about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll throw this in and then I promise I'll let everybody else speak before yes. I speak again. Or, or we can just talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I would, I would, if I can ask this, why is it that the, the other would be a perspective other, would be a divinity or something beyond the human? Why is it that it would not instead be something before the human? And so I think that there's good reason that we actually are, have absolutely solid proof that humans uh, or human ancestors interacted with other species of hominid. And that there were in fact many species of human-like organisms on the planet that were distinct morphologically, probably, almost certainly distinct culturally. Uh, they existed for a long time. We have no evidence of uh, uh, warfare or conflict between them, but nonetheless, there's only one human species on the planet today. Uh, an interesting question that maybe a lot more fossils and, uh, and stones and so on would, would uh, uh, be able to answer is, was there social, uh, stratification in the Paleolithic do, uh, among these different species? Uh, and might there then have been this sort of othering function in these different groups? Hard to answer, but there is evidence certainly that there were different species alive at the same time and cohabitating in, in the same regions, for example. We know this in the Near East, we know this in parts of Africa, we know this in parts of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, the, the question about the philosophers don't do answers. <laughs> well. <laughs> Really well. That's what that's like. So, so of course, what I'm going to do is sort of say, well, let me try to get clearer on the question. Um, the I think there are different perspectives we can take, right? And so one one of the perspectives we can take about what is human is the question, um, what does it mean for for us to be human? So, what does it mean for we as human beings to live as human beings and to think of ourselves as human beings, right? So, on the one hand, that might be something like a practical question. So, how does how does one um, how does one become a human, in other words? So sometimes in, in philosophy we talk about the human as something that is not a category, but rather an achievement. Um, it's something that you have to learn how to be and learn how to do. Um, and so that's, I, there are, I think, depending on what perspective you take, the question of what it means to be human is going to give you very different answers. So from within the perspective of what does it mean to be human, live as human, I think you're going to get one set of answers. I think the other set of answers is something more like a kind of what I'm going to call a third person or sort of observer perspective. Imagine a, a sort of God's eye view um, observer looking at the planet and saying, these things over here are human and these things over here are not human. Right? But again, taking that perspective and thinking about the question that way is going to give you a very different set of answers than if you think about it from the, what, what sometimes we call the practical perspective of what does it mean to sort of live as human, be a human. Um, so I, I guess I'm slightly more interested in the practical questions about what does it mean to sort of live as a human, be a human being. Um, and that's where I think the, the sort of the moral stuff kind of gets up and running. Um, but uh, I just wanted to kind of flag that depending on what perspective you take, you're going to get very different kinds of answers. Just throwing that in. Yeah, I, I guess I'll jump in just because it's probably like the closest entry point. Of, you, know, you know, I think obviously, you know, as a sociologist, I'm more concerned with these questions of 
you know, what you're saying, you know, the experience of kind of living as human um, and the kind of behaviors around this. And then, of course, the social media is like, well, what if, how does the environment play, you know, into um, how we think of ourselves as human and, you know, our identities and then how we kind of react to that. And I think that, um, you know, when we look at kind of urban landscape, when we think about power, you know, I was thinking about this because, you know, I was talking to Jamie, I was like, you know, this is some anthropological question, you know, it's, it's having me think in ways that I'm not used to thinking in, which is great. And so I was like, I was thinking about, you know, when you look at this in kind of power, right, being human, at least in my research, is someone who's given respect, power, and access, decision-making table, uh, table, but in Baby Hunter's point, from residential eyes, um, you know, being human is someone who is white, middle to upper class, has social capital and a knowledge of how city politics work, right? So who are asked to the table. But this isn't always as clear cut of, you know, this kind of black white thing. It's plenty to do with class as well, because there are upper class blacks that are asked to the table as well and given that type of respect in these type of conversations as well. But I think another component that um, that I borrow um, from another sociologist is that another aspect I thought was interesting is that um, there are kind of two things that are going on here. I think that, 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 the, that the humans or the residents in my research um, interpret their lives now, but also from the past as well, all in the same moment, right? So one of the major themes that I've brought out in some of my publications has been, um, you know, a lot of the black, Latino, Samoan, San Franciscans think about their lives in this past tense in the effects that urban renewal has had on their communities and neighborhoods as well as in this contemporary sense, then feeling like they're still dislocated and so isolated from the process. Um, so, you know, bringing Foucault in this, and I wanted to say a piece from Discipline and Punish, um, you know, what Foucault does in Discipline and Punish is he really theorizes this new relationship um, between the body, space, and institutional power that is quote unquote politically and economically useful, economically useful to society. And I said that he, he talks about framing, the way he frames this is the transformation of our penal system from public torture to um, the penitentiary, which I think is fascinating because, you know, at that point, pain is no longer the kind of penalty, right? It's rules, it's prohibition, um, it's, it's law, the way the bodies are kind of controlled within this landscape of power. Um, and I just wanted to read a little piece, just a little paragraph from Discipline and Punish that I thought was really interesting. Um, he said, but the body is also directly involved in the political field. Power relations have immediate hold on it. They invest it, they market, train it, torture it, force it to carry out tasks, to perform ceremonies, to emit signs. The political investment of the body is bound up in accordance with complex reciprocal relations with its economic use. It is largely as a force of production that the body is invested with relations of power and domination. But on the other hand, its constitution as labor power is possible only if it's caught up in a system of subjection, in which need is also a political instrument meticulously prepared, calculated, and used. Right? So this is something I'm seeing that's happening in these meetings with the agendas. Um, they hold these meetings, but when residents don't follow that, we're not when their, their body is not moving in a way that's politically and economically useful to the institutional power, then they're rule breakers. And as we'll talk about in the second question, once they're rule breakers, then their concerns are no longer legitimate, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you're not following the rules, so mm -hmm. you know your whole your whole life living <coughs> in this neighborhood is now you know not important. And at least that's the way that these residents felt in the meeting and the kind of perception that I see from it as well. So I think that that you know going back to kind of like you know this experience and what it feels like when you're kind of within these realms of power, you know how we perceive ourselves to be human. I think. Is a you know I think it's a different question. It's a different point as well. It's just a, it's more about what you're asking at the same time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to build a link between urbanization in San Francisco and many in your ancient North Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm glad that you brought up this question for the difference between what a human is and kind of maybe in scientific terms and what it means to be human. Um, because when you said like a human is obviously like this kind of this bundle of traits, I was like, no, a human being is obviously a body and a soul. Mm -hmm. And maybe a mind. Mm -hmm. um, so most of the texts that I read that are philosophical texts are called something like on the nature of the human being, on the constitution of the human being. Um, 
and they draw upon scientific literature at the time. I think what um, I want to kind of throw in there to this conversation about what it means to be human is not just what it means to act as a human being, but how human bodies are different, differently experienced, mm -hmm. and where it is that we draw our coordinates for saying this is obviously the human, the human being. Um, the human being is obviously genetically defined. I mean, in some ways, yes, and then in other ways, very obviously not. Um, but I haven't yet come to the connection to San Francisco. Um, and so in late antiquity, first couple of centuries when Christianity is becoming first uh, allowed and then compulsory, there's a lot of concern to define the human being and to define the human body. Um, and one of the ways that people do that is through telling people how to behave. Mm -hmm. And so you have the rule breakers, um, and some of the rule breakers are rule breakers because they don't think the right thing, but um, you can also be a rule breaker, for example, because you drink too much, mm -hmm. because you eat the wrong food, because you have sex with the wrong people. Mm -hmm. And so asceticism kind of takes off in early Christianity as a way of molding bodies and sculpting bodies. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the broad of concern of what it means um, to be in a kind of, you have something of a dualistic philosophy coming in, you have a body and a soul, but you also have an incarnation mm -hmm. of a god, and so people are kind of smudging together different models. Um, and this is what I was thinking about when you said on one hand you have the animals, and on the other hand you have the gods, maybe, question mark. At this period, um, when they're kind of setting the tone for how you'll think about what it means to be a body, in medieval Europe at least, you're both. And so human beings participate in animal nature, they have material bodies, they eat things, they sleep, they are pretty much animals, but human beings can also have ideas and dreams and they, um, they make war on each other. They do things that animals don't do, they rationalize, they do mathematics. And so there's a kind of, people are trying to be both people see themselves as both animals and gods at this period. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, um, there's a desire to control that that I think comes out in the rules that then people are seen to be, mm -hmm. to be breaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I was just, you know, Paul was interested in what you were saying about um, you know, you were talking about like studying difference biologically, something pretty new relatively from what you were saying, mm -hmm. right? You were saying, um, you gave some statistics about that, and I'm just wondering why, why do you think that biology, I mean, you know, obviously I know, you know, eugenics, I know uh, it as a political tool, but I'm, I'm just interested in, in why, why do you think that differences, differences among humans have become you know, start to be a focus of study after so long. Mm -hmm. Like, it, I guess socially, you know, is there a reason why you think that? Yeah, uh, a worthwhile thing to do is pretty important uh, to, to the answer. Um, I'll say, uh, if you look at the Systema Naturae, which is, of course, the first classificatory text, uh, or I should say the, the classificatory text, which is the basis for all the classifications biologically that are used today, mm -hmm. there is some system of scientific nomenclature whereby we were given the name Homo sapiens, um, uh, you know, sort of wise men. Uh, uh, it's also a worthwhile thing to reflect that these names themselves have their own sort of politics. So why is they were called mammals? I think this is kind of funny. Why is it called mammals? This is a funny little story. Mammals. Why is it that, that, that uh, the class of organisms that we are is called mammals? Because there's other defining features. I mean, yeah, well, of course, mammary glands, just we, you know, are, we have those, we all have those. Uh, we all have bits of them, some of them aren't functional for some of us, that's okay. But why is it? Because, you know, we also have hair, and that's what separ separates us from other tetrapods, uh, the things with four legs, which is the major uh, uh, goal that Linnaeus wanted to accomplish with this differentiation. Well, um, it's maybe very clear here that politics, actually, when you go through his correspondence, he actually was a diehard advocate for breastfeeding. So he actually, he was because at the time, he, he was under the impression that by letting, you know, Europe, there was this theory that was going around that if you let your children uh, breastfeed from wet nurses, they would somehow be denied the, like, you know, the, the special nutrients or the, the, the effect that the mother's milk was better. And that 
uh, you shouldn't let your white moms uh, give their white babies to nurses of the lower class or different colors to, to uh, supple. So they needed to, in fact, nurse from the mom. So he actually used this, if you read his correspondence, as the basis for giving the special status to the member glands, the name of the mammalia. He could have done any one of a variety of other names. But, uh, but so the politics here is very apparent. But the politics is right through all this classification. So uh, when you actually look at the different, uh, when you look at Homo sapiens, there's a few things that are interesting. Uh, one is that he doesn't actually give a definition. He gives definitions for all sorts of animals. But for the species Homo sapiens, uh, he just says, no so you uh, uh, know thyself. OK? This old sort of Greek, I think it's Socratic dictum, or uh, maybe Platonic Aristotle, someone with one of the three animals. Yeah, I saw one of Anyway, know thyself. So uh, it's sort of the, what is, it, is this the, the sort of the obscenity thesis, or the kind of, you know, I'll know it when I see it. So that's how he says you'll know it here. Uh, later on, he goes on in successive uh, editions of this work to more um, uh, 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 sort of precisely define different bits and pieces of the human. And here's where it gets interesting: is that he actually makes subgroups of the human that are defined not just by skin color, but by um, behavioral, we might call them behavioral characteristics. Maybe later we call them in anthropology, we call them cultural characteristics. But um, the the red man. Homo sanguinis was not just red, so called, but he was also cunning. Hmm. The uh, the African Homo africanus was not just uh, black, but he was lazy. The Asian was you know conniving or whatever. The white man was upstanding, of course. Right? Of course. Uh, so uh, there were the, and then there was a whole other list. So they these they. For a while, he incorporated these old ideas about the humors into the system. But the point is that there was always an attempt to link behavior to biology, these really classifications, and to use these as explanations for human difference. Um, I mean, I could, I could say some more things about how that operated in the past, but I, I think that we can go into it if you want. But the, the short answer is that for a very long time, the operative assumption was that. Uh, if there are different looking people and they do different things, there must be some connection between those two facts. That they look different and they do different things than us, you know, colonizing uh, Europeans. So um, it probably took uh, a very long time uh, for uh, uh, and, and for the the you know it, it took a lot of <laughs> it, it, it took a long long history of colonialism before they recognized that you know yes Asians and Africans and what can if you know take uh, you know if, if they go through the same European education system, for example, achieve the same thing as Europeans. Uh, that insight had to sink in, and it was still resisting. <laughs> I might even say there's still remnants of this resistance today to this kind of idea. But yeah, for a long time, this is the basic assumption. They look different, therefore, they're behaviorally different, and these two things are essentially connected. Uh, that was the basis for classifications of humans uh, for a long time, and that was, you know, in animals, that kind of works, because culture is not so important a differentiator in animals. I mean, I, my big claim would be something like humans one thing that makes humans different is that uh, we can end up many different ways despite all being more the same way because environments or in particular culture is so important for us in shaping us. But for a long time that insight was not understood and so classification linked very, very clearly appearance and behavior. So I just want to jump in really quickly and, and share some notes about um, the Part of what I'm picking up from all of you is sort of stories about how we felt about who we are. Um, and for me, there's kind of two ways to go about thinking about it. One is to sort of pick up, you know, how do we talk about who we are? And that involves language and discourse. But then how do we classify the languages of ourselves and others? Um, and maybe it's even sort of segues to our next question, but thinking about, um, we've talked about in the class, um, prescriptivism and kind of ideal or um, very strict and narrow definitions of what counts as human language. Um, and we've looked at texts, particularly some, some sort of colonial era texts, some Darwinian sort of stuff um, that sort of includes people who 
are describing being in other environments, um, just to sort of pick up on some of the segments, being in other environments um, where they're surrounded by people unlike themselves. Um, and when it comes to describing the way these other people talk, they say, hey, this person spoke a whole bunch of gibberish around me, I didn't even know. Oh, he spoke just like an ape, uh, right? And what they're doing is they're denigrating the way that person speaks, and they're not counting that mode of communication as language. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm looking at that, and you know, we could go medieval with that, but then we could also go urban and sort of talk about um, you know, Philly talk, mm -hmm. and the way that folks talk here, um, and, and how we feel about that, right? There's, there's ways of performing and